Welcome back, Engine Performance Expo viewers. Again, Lake Speed Jr. And today we got a special treat. I'm here with one of my favorite people in the whole wide world, Ron Shaver. Here at the Dino Cell at Shaver Specialty Racing Engines. Yeah, yeah. And Ron, you've been building mechanical fuel injection engines for way before I was even born. For 40 years. Yeah, 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 before I was born. I figured that might be the case. Yeah. So, Obviously, we know a lot about carburetors. I grew up, my dad, you know, racing carburetors and high-speed needle and low-speed needle. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you're talking high-speed and low-speed jets here, right? Yes, yes. So, Everything's done with the jets and nozzles. So talk to us, tell us about, for us who are unindoctrinated into mechanical fuel injection, how, well, how is mechanical fuel injection different than a carburetor? What makes it different? Well, it doesn't have any uh, air-operated parts, you know, so the carburetor works on vacuum. air going in right. vacuum. So this works on mechanical. This works on a fuel pump and a barrel valve and jets. And the, 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 uh, the jets are what control the fuel. So it, it'd be like a, a, a high-speed in a, in, a, in a carburetor, you know. Okay. And, um, so, so the, the fuel pump's basically always putting out fuel. It's positive yes, displacement, yes. engine's running, right. it's moving fuel. Right. So and it's going to... It, it goes to the nozzle. Okay. We have different nozzles here, as you mm -hmm. can see. This is a what we call a bullet nozzle. It just squirts, a, just a squirt. Right. And this one here is a sprayer nozzle that just sprays. Okay. So when you put this nozzle in the port, it sprays, it gets rid of some air. So okay. it takes some horsepower. So this is for high speed, this is for low speed, and this is what controls your idle. It's called a spool or a barrel valve. Mm -hmm. And that ramp is actually ground. Okay. You can see it as it opens. Mm -hmm. So it has a secondary hole. So it's sitting in the engine like this, but this controls the throttle. Okay, that was my going. next question, okay. Yeah. Now, so the carburetor, you move the, thr the throttle, right. it changes how much fuel is delivered. Right, this is what this does. Okay. And so when you get it open, it's that whole slot's open, so it's not on this anymore. This is actually covered. Okay. And, and it actually fits in here. Okay. And, um, and this is basically what's distributing the fuel out. That's right. This goes to the nozzles. All right. So you can see it in there. I don't know if you can see it or not. Oh, yeah. See it? See it going? So. That's perfect. Yeah, we'll, we'll do this. We'll hold this right okay. over here. Sure. So the guys can see it on the camera right here. Yeah. Yeah. As that moves, yeah. it moves that opening. So the fuel mm -hmm. distribution changes based on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that controls the throttle. So that, that goes to the foot feed in the car and uh, controls everything. But the pump... It, it's really com it's not really complex, but it's it's pretty simple. But the nozzles go up in the size of the engine. So if you have an 800 horsepower engine, you have a bigger nozzle. Do you need more fuel? Right. Okay. Um, but we might not need a bigger pump. So, for instance, this is a, a Kinsler pump. Okay. And it's a half gallon a minute pump. Half gallon a minute yeah, pump. Okay. Right. And this is the pump that we use, and it it pumps it pumps into the barrel valve. And the barrel valve distributes to the nozzles, which are in the head. Okay. And they can be in the head or they can be right here. Mm -hmm. um, we use them in the head because they make more power. But you can use them up here if you want to kill the power. So let's say... So that's what we call an up nozzle and a down nozzle. Yeah. So down nozzle is the one in the head. Yes. The up nozzle is the one yes. basically in the runner. Yeah. So if you're at a, a track where there's no grip and you don't need any power, you Take just move up. the nozzles up. Got it. Okay. And if you're a track with grip, you want all the power you can get, you move them down. And, and that's pretty much been that way since we invented the, uh, the uh, down nozzle. And the down nozzle was invented by Dan Gurney, believe it or not. Something else, Dan yeah. Gurney. If anybody doesn't know, Dan Gurney invented like pretty much everything, right? Yeah, he's unbelievable. <laughs> so he thought of that one day, and, and we were sitting around thinking about how to do it, because the, the heads weren't made for them yet, so mm -hmm. we had to drill and through the water and weld them in and all that and um, Junior Kurtz actually pioneered it with Stuart Van Dyne a little bit more oh, than yeah. before I stepped in and did my thing with it okay. and, and um, but it's it's been ever since we did that it's been the standard. The down nozzle is yes. the way to make more power. Yeah. When we put them in it made 40 more horsepower instantly. 40? 
Yeah. Four zero. And so wow. Then we were we were messing around with the nozzles one day, and Mr. Hillborn, who is the the original designer of these mm -hmm. fuel injections, um, he said, "Well, if you really want more power, why don't you just squirt a stream instead of spraying it?" So he made me some nozzles. Okay. And that was another twenty. Another twenty. Yeah. Now, why so, was the stream better than this one that's got the, the screen in it? It would basically break the fuel up, so it's yeah. not a jet, it's more of a yeah. spray. That, that actually takes air away. Takes air away. Yeah. Okay. So, when you spread it out like that, not mm -hmm. as much air can get by it. Right. So, okay. and the squirter just shoots a stream. Now, where do you, you don't shoot it on the cylinder wall, we right? Shoot it on, we always shoot the valve right at the back of the valve, right okay. at, the, at the valve radius. Yep, that yeah. way it's, that, that's what's breaking the fuel yeah. out. And that, that's how that works. And I, I couldn't believe it would work, but it did. Um, and then this particular nozzle is for a guy with a 360 who can't, you're not allowed to use nozzles, so we put this long extension inside. Okay, get it so way down. Cheat it down, yeah. <laughs> you didn't see that, guys. Yeah. So, <laughs> we... Uh, now, what's the thing that I've always heard about mechanical fuel injection? That it's the return you know, jet that actually is what controls the fuel system. It's not so much the one that's limiting on, yeah. the, in, on the inside, it's on yeah. the return. So, so wh why is that the case? What, what's this? So this, this pump, Okay. so the center, the center one always goes to the barrel valve. Okay. okay, the center feeds the barrel and valve. And these are, these are all on the same pressure system. Okay. So you'd have a bypass here. Okay. And a high-speed bypass here. And this is a high-speed bypass that we use. It's a, it's a Kinsler unit. Okay. It works great. We always use uh, Kinsler fuel, or uh, Kinsler uh, high-speed and pump, mm -hmm. but we use Engler injector. Okay. And the Engler injector seems to run a little better. Okay. So that's where we're at with that. But so what you do is you take this jet and this, so let's say you've got all the fuel running in here and you got it, you want to lean it out so you take this jet and it has a spring in it in there. So this is the poppet and the spring, this is a high speed Okay. The spring's real big and you, you buy, you got to have a batch of springs mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's how you control the pressure and this goes in there and then the jet goes in here like this together and that's a regulator now so that would go on the pump okay and it, there's many jets like probably from 40 to 80 okay you know that's what we'd be using for jets and then when you go to gasoline of course it gets pretty big yeah so it doubles in size so if you're using a 40 on or a 50 on alcohol you'd be using a you know a, a 100 on gas okay so um, and is that because back. the smaller jet basically pushes more fuel right. into the engine, and right. you need more fuel you going need, into you the need engine? Twice the fuel on alcohol. Right. So that's yeah. the whole thing. So that return jet mm -hmm. has got to be bigger on gasoline, yes. otherwise it would be just big rich. Yes. Got it. Okay. So, so it's thinking backwards, you got to you, you the, the pump's going to make X amount of fuel. It's moving X amount of fuel. Yes. So the smaller the return jet, the more fuel goes into the engine. Correct. Okay. Got it. Correct, and and that's also controlled by the nozzle size. So okay. every one of these nozzles has a number on it. For instance, this is an alcohol nozzle, five ninety. Okay. All right. So that's basically the number that 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 would be. It depends on what injector. So Kinsler mm -hmm. and uh, Engler use numbers like this. Yep. But Hilburn, that would be a fourteen A in Hilburn. Okay, so they use a different number yeah. system. Okay. But Hilburn, I don't think they're even making nozzles anymore. But um, so if you have a bigger nozzle you wouldn't need as big a bypass got it so that leaves a bit there's a lot of tuner stuff here so do you i have can already see a this. high speed dish a high speed deal or mm -hmm. do you want a low speed deal okay you know so we found that high speed you know like high pressure works better than low pressure so we'll have a kind of like a high speed jet low speed jet on the yeah. carburetor stuff i'm used to so we have this set here this one's set at a 114 with a 64. 114 Before, pounds. Yeah, of so fuel that pressure. that means that when that gets to 114 pounds, this opens and bleeds some fuel off. Got it. You know, on gasoline, it'd be half of that. Right. So it, it's re there's so that's really that's a high speed. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's got to have a ton of pressure, ton of pressure for it to start bleeding yeah. anything off. 
And that, that pump will make, you know, 200, 300 PSI without even trying if you deadhead it. Okay. So it's really So does that pump. mean on the low speed side, you basically are trying to take fuel away? Because otherwise you'd be putting too much fuel in the engine? Well, this is really the high speed. So as we go up in the RPM and we've got this fixed, right? Yep. We overcome, we overcome that jet. So the pressure starts building. Okay. And then this opens. Opens, got it. Okay. So that keeps the fuel fuel schedule, you know, similar. Okay, got it. Okay, so you're controlling fuel flow with that yeah. essentially, mm -hmm. but then pressure is what's giving you right the okay, got it. Yeah, so, flow and pressure, which are two yeah. different things. So. So, you know, the butterflies are all everything's all hooked up on linkage. So, when it when it opens the butterfly, that it pulls the barrel valve at the same time. It's really, it's really a pretty simple system. Um, guys yeah. tend to, to get confused because there's so many adjustments. You know, you can adjust the jet, you can adjust the high speed, you can adjust the nozzle size. So when the customer calls if he's green about it and he doesn't know what to do, mm -hmm. he, there's a lot of things you got to tell him what to do. Right. So you probably need to have a baseline setup. Hey, yeah. you need to have these so, parts in these places then we can know what not right. what adjustments to make. It's not like a carburetor where you, you put jets in it and, and, and everything works off a vacuum, you know? Right. This this all is mechanical. There's no 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 aids. So you've got to adjust everything just so. Like the barrel valve, we, we actually take the barrel valve, this spool, mm -hmm. and we, we leak it down. And we leak it down at, uh, we'll say, on a big engine, 22%. Okay. And, and we do that with air. And so that, that means that this position would be where, like right here, so it's going over this hump. Right. Right? When it hits 22%, we know it'll idle. Okay. It's the idle circuit, okay? Because so, it's giving it just enough fuel. Yeah. So basically, you have idle, high speed, low speed, and, and that's about in a secondary valve, which is this hole mm -hmm. right here. And that's used for when you lift. It doesn't shove all the nozzles. It all in the nozzles. It shoves it out a front jet. So oh, this has okay. a, this has a jet also. Right. Okay. So when that hole opens, mm -hmm. it bleeds off. Okay. So we set that at about normally on a big engine, fifty-five pounds, fifty-eight pounds. Got it. And then put a jet in there to control it. That way, when you go back, so if you if you if you need to pedal it, yeah. it's, it's not stumbling because right. it's so rich. Right. It's going rich lane, rich lane. Yeah, this is cool. This is why I want to talk to Ron about this stuff. But this, you know, it, it, it's 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 transpired. It's actually been this way since '49, but we've added a lot of things. You fine tuned. Yeah, because this this system actually ran a speedway motor. Okay. So yeah. it had to have all kinds of stuff on it, you know, for the turbos and all that stuff and. So it's got a lot of potential, to, but it's still to this day it's well 49, 1949, and we're still using it. So it's pretty good. Still winning races. Still winning races. Um, it's kind of amazing. I, mean, I guess for methanol, because you have to deliver so much fuel. Yeah. Something like this maybe is a I want to say the better route, but it's a really good way of doing it just because the the pure volume of fuel. You yeah, have to, to, to it, it's made to run on alcohol. Okay. Alcohol is much more forgiving than gas. Mm -hmm. You can be 20% rich on alcohol and not hurt the power. On gas, probably you, three, four. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's pretty, pretty different in that way. It's really good for sprint car guys because they're always messing with everything, mm -hmm. and um, they can be a little rich. And it, 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 it's a big cushion for the engine builder. You got 950 horsepower from 400 cubic inches and 728 foot pounds of torque. It's probably pretty touchy when it gets up there. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You, you don't. Know, you're, you're, you you, you want to have as much window to operate uh, in as you can. Yeah, I mean you're getting up in you know turbo country when you start talking that kind of power mm -hmm. with that little of an engine. And the thing that's beautiful about it in a sprint car, you have no electronics, so. Mm -hmm. There's just a magneto and that, and it's all mechanical, so there's no wires to be messing with, no trick set up, you know, right. you've got to go back to your computer and dial <laughs> in. And no laptops. It's all mechanical, so it's really easy to work at it with a track. Mm -hmm. a track. So, um, so I guess, you know, reading spark plugs is really important with this. Yes, yes. 
Because yeah. you, you know, I said you don't have all the other data channels that an electronic system is going to give right. you to know. Okay, I'm rich, I'm lean. Right. You know, you've got to really so know how to read your plugs. When you're on alcohol, you know, we we run high compression with alcohol, like sixteen to one, mm -hmm. and um, you know, you you got to read the plug a little bit differently because it's so cold that it, it doesn't give you all the similar traits that a gas burning plug would. So okay. we read the ground strap. Right. And when it goes past the bend, it's getting a little lean, and then mm -hmm. we look for pepper. Okay. And pepper is off of the, uh, coming off the tops of the pistons. Okay. So when you get when you get all that stuff just right, it, you'll be just right to the bend, mm -hmm. and there'll be no pepper. That's when it's right. Yeah. And if you're getting lean, the uh, electrode that goes through the porcelain, it'll start melting the edges off it. And that means you're getting ready to do a piston. <laughs> so to get, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's really something that you, you give it to a new guy and he's going to be confused but once he gets the hang of it it's it's no problem um you know we get a lot of guys coming into the sport you know recently mm -hmm. and and uh, they don't know anything so we give them a sheet okay and we do everything off of altitude so yeah of course. 99 you know altitude to, mm -hmm. we go 90 to 99 and and then we give them a sheet what jet it should have, what high speed jet it should have, what spring it should be in it. Okay. And that gets them close. Mm -hmm. And then um, if they want to go further, we go to the chassis dyno with the engine. Right. Put it in the car and put it in the chassis yeah, dyno. Really fine tune. Yeah. Tim, Tim Engler is one of the best at that. Is he? Yes. Yes. He's very good. Because he's, he's got a big inertia at chassis dyno, yeah, right? Yeah. He's got a big one that'll start the car. And it's pretty nice. <laughs> That's yeah. cool. Yeah. It's pretty neat. Well, awesome. Well, Ryan, we can't thank you enough for taking the time to kind of explain what all these parts and pieces are, you know, because sometimes people, yeah, think this is kind of either it's black magic voodoo that you can't understand or it's just archaic technology, yeah. but in reality, mate, it's yeah. very simple, straightforward. It's controlled like. by the fuel pump and the nozzles, and then you just regulate the fuel. Mm -hmm. You know, you put that on there with all, without all the fuel, guy, fuel valves, it won't even run hardly. It'll just sit there and idle and that's it <laughs> so you have to get the barrel valve set right mm -hmm. and then you got to get these set right and you don't have to be close you know if you get it 20 percent rich mm -hmm. which is all what i recommend to the guy so they never burn them up right then they can creep up on it yeah. you know and creep up on it with a jet high speed and and uh, i'd leave the secondary alone i'd never touch it. i'd leave it at 58 pounds and maybe put an 80 jet in it to start mm -hmm. and run it and see if it throttles good. So that's going to show you when you lift out, if you're right, when you go back, it'll all be home. It'll be there. Yeah. You know, if it's, if it's, if it's too uh, rich, it'll stumble. Double. and Yeah. So that's cool. Well, again, Ron, thank you so much. We can't thank you enough for taking the time to explain all this, everybody. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed watching this segment. Thanks for being part of the Engine Performance Expo. The Engine Performance Expo rolls on here at Straub Technologies and just starting off 2022 in a great way. Got Lake Speed back and Dan Begley from Mala and uh, very important parts of the engine. We're going to discuss right now Lake and our build engine. Exactly. Yeah, we already had the Mala pistons in there and we also had the Mala bearings and gaskets on the engine. So Dan, talk a little bit about the parts we have and what are these parts right here? Oh, bring out some new parts that we brought out. The, the engine, mm -hmm. these are actually the same engine bearings that we put in that engine right there. Fantastic. Uh, these are the new LS engine bearings. Mm -hmm. uh, what we found is as different cranks are made, the radius in the cranks are changed. And, Correct. Uh, they're there's starting to have some interference on the corners here mm -hmm. and here. So what we did is I made a new bearing for the LS that would it's a little narrower here okay so it can chamfer of the radius doesn't get right. into there uh it fixes a lot of the issues that people were having of just having point loads on the on the on the two corners so so the bearing is actually slightly narrow and the, chamfered the, the, or is the, it just chamfered? The, the actual footprint of the bearing is the same okay all we did was we just had to come in here and just change the, the angle of the chamfer a little bit because it's only about ten thousandths per side is mm -hmm. all it was hitting on and we managed to just not change the footprint so it doesn't change anything fitting into the block perfect it just gives the radius clearance uh so so things can move and you're good things move because things uh, are going to move when you put a lot of boost yeah, and so 
a lot of the, a lot of the cranks are they're putting more radius in there to get more strength of the crankshaft, right. which is great. That's a good thing. But yes. unfortunately, they do this and they don't consult with us. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. So they took space we might you not didn't have. have right. yeah, yeah, they took my space up. Right. Exactly. So I had to make space. space. Yep. So, but that's a it's a cool. Deal. The other interesting thing is, uh, typically speaking, a thrust bearing mm -hmm. uh, because there's a whole lot more cross section when you right. crushed bearing in. Mm -hmm. If you if they paid attention to some of the other presentations I right. did. Um, so I increased the clearance just a couple tenths per okay. shell here and there. So nice. you get your old clearance the same mm -hmm. on there. We did give a new port number. It's in our catalog, MS2411. Okay. Um, it's an H bearing, so it's a performance bearing. Right. Uh, rather if you want to know the difference between an H bearing and a P bearing, go back and watch the previous videos. Yeah. He did a fantastic job explaining that. Yep. So we're, you know, trying to come up and market with um, improvements of the problems that we see out there right. with uh, solutions to what's going exactly. on. That evolution of power, yeah. make your stronger crankshaft, add a little more radius to mm -hmm. strengthen it, but now you need a bearing to accommodate exactly. that. Exactly. So the other one is, uh, is this particular one's a big block Chevy. Okay. Uh, we make for a small block Chevy also, but there was a, there was your standard an X bearing. Well, we made a double X because okay. as crankshafts are coming in, they were still ground on. A lot of these are import cranks coming in, and right. they're ground to the large side of spec. Okay. And if a guy wants to run a lot of oil clearance on there, he couldn't. Could. So with an XX, it's two thousandths off of standard. Oh, nice. So it makes it easy to, if they want to run thicker oil, mm -hmm. Mr. Oil. Yep. Okay. Right. Because um, if you're running a lot of boost, you got a lot of fuel, you're probably going to need a little bit thicker mm -hmm. oil. Yep. You need thicker oil, so you want more clearance so you can get to oil to move. Yep. And we made an XX small block Chevy, big block Chevy, rods and mains. Nice. In an H performance bearing. So that's good um, stuff right there. You bracket racers or something like that mm -hmm. that's out there, we, we got you covered. So that's awesome. Um, new things. Um, what about the gaskets? Gaskets, we yeah. We, uh, Mala's on a big thing, Mala performance gaskets. Uh, we have a, we're, we're really pushing hard on the on our gasket line, what we're doing mm -hmm. on performance stuff. Um, different applications, we're continuing. Thank you. Oh, very well. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, well, I'm so impressed by these gaskets. We sat down before and I'm looking at them and, uh, you know, who gets excited about gaskets, right? <laughs> Except these are really nice. Yeah, they are. Uh, we, we've gone through a lot of uh, working on different materials. Mm -hmm. uh, we've introduced a lot of these. Matter of fact, uh, the majority of the nitro top fuel cars are running Oh, this guy's perfect. Here. Awesome. Uh, it's 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 proven to hold up there. Uh, we have a lot of intake gaskets that Joe's playing with here. That's admiring our beauty. I'm admiring. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, so I noticed the texture. Yes. So different thicknesses, different out head cylinder heads. Uh, we're we're growing that proc line mm -hmm. heavily. Uh, we're committed on a new performance line, and we're not going to make gaskets for you know a 1950. Studebaker, okay. yeah, yeah. Studebaker. <laughs> we'll go with that. Sorry, Studebaker uh, guys. Yeah. No <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, no uh, but so what we're looking at there's there's new technologies and just like with bearings and materials, mm -hmm. there's always new technologies. So right. you, you have to look at all right, is is this material a good material? Or is it going to be better? Uh, you can look at gasket materials and and you know typically a gasket and I tell all the engineers and we work with is like gaskets. It's it's a pass or fail item. To, uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Yeah. Did it leak on the floor? <laughs> right. right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, okay, it's good. But uh, you know, come to Mala, there was a there's a lot more. So we're working on new technologies of better sealing surfaces mm -hmm. on there to hold up better. Awesome. So. Excellent. Well, it's great to see you guys kind of pushing forward in an area that you know maybe some didn't think it was necessary. You're doing it anyway because racing dictates we want to push forward in everything. Absolutely. Dan, thank you very much. Lake, the, the build continues, the right? The build does between, continue, yes. We learn a little bit about parts, pieces, some tech, some information, and mm -hmm. then back to the engine. Where are we going? So now we're going to go to the oil primer because this is an LS engine. So there's a little bit of a trick if you're trying to prime that oil pump because it's a little bit different than your regular small block Chevrolet. Watch the video and find out. Hi there, I'm Lake Speed Jr., Total Seal Piston Rings, and I'm along with Jeff Havens from Silver Seal Products. Awesome. So today we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is proper lubrication, which if you've heard me talk before, you probably know that proper lubrication can be defined as the four R's. Right oil, right place, right time, and right amount. So they might be wondering what the heck we're doing 
with this? <laughs> right? What does this have to do with an oil pump or an LS engine? So tell us a little bit about the reason why this canister is sitting up here. In the old days, you could prime a motor with a drill. That's right. The new days, you can't do that. You've got to have some sort of pressurized system to get that oil up through, up into the rockers. So we, but, uh, but before you get to that point, okay. why? Why can't I just use this? There's no distributor. Oh, that's right. Because before, what we had is this old school type pump, right? That was sitting in the oil pan. That's correct. That was run from the distributor. That's the, right. The, uh, shaft that went up and you could take the distributor out of your small block Chevrolet. Right. Use this with a little tool. Yeah. Spin it and then you could run it until you get oil pressure. That's correct. Now, what's different about this and that standard old small block Chevrolet and that? Everything's electronic. There's no distributor. So everything's run off the crank in most cases. So, yes. So this is your modern oil pump for mm. what is our today's small block Chevrolet, also right. known as the LS. LS. And this does not sit in the oil pan. It is not submerged in oil. It sits on front of the crankshaft and is a gear rotor pump that's driven, like I said, by the crankshaft. So you can't use this nope. to prime that. Nope. So now their answer is pressurized vessel to get that oil through the engine. So you can get oil pressure without having to turn the engine over. Now, you know I've done a video in my past life when I was at Driven Racing Oil, and we actually had a CT525, which is a LS-based race engine. And we did a test to see how long it would take to get oil pressure without using your cool tool, but just spinning it over with right. the ignition turned off. So no ignition, so it's not firing, but spinning the engine at 200 RPM, how long it took to get oil pressure after an oil change. Remember, oil pump's not in the crankshaft. It's not submerged in oil. It's the very front of the engine. It took 27 seconds to get oil pressure in that engine after doing an oil change because all of that tubing, right? The pickup tube is way down there. All that time and distance it took to get oil pressure because of that distance in time to refill the system. So what you're doing is I say, hey, you don't have to have your engine running dry, no lubrication for 27 seconds. You can fill the system with pressurized oil so the moment it turns over, there's lubrication. That's correct. I, I, I love this. Yeah. Absolutely love this. And which is really important, what we're doing here at the Engine Performance Expo this year is we're trying to build a 10,000 RPM LS engine that's going to make over a thousand horsepower. Right. <laughs> uh, lubrication's kind of important. You kind of want to have right oil, right place, right time, right amount. So thank you for bringing this to us. That way we can make sure we can protect that investment in parts because yep. without having proper lubrication, a bad day. Bad, a bad day. Bad, bad, bad day is day. coming. So uh, tell everybody, how would you go about finding this part? You can find this through one of our distributors. Uh, we've got distributors all over the country. Uh, you can check us out on the website, or you can uh, give us a call. We can tell you a local guy that would have these in stock. Um, is there anything special that you need to, I mean, obviously it's a pressure vessel, so you yeah. need to have some pressurized air, I see, I see so, the fitting, so you would need to, how do you put oil in it? So it's got a, a screw on cap here, Okay. and then uh, it has a two gallon, eight quart capacity, All right. eight foot hose, Okay. We comes with all the different fittings you need to do all, just about 99% of the engine applications out there. It's got a safety blow off valve on it, so you can't put too much air in it. Nice. Uh, and um, on off switch here that, Let's oil out. Oil out. So instructions are on the back. So that's dope. Pretty simple. I love pretty it. Simple. That's cool. Yeah. Keep it simple, stupid, right? It always right. works best. That's right. So so there you go. So moving on, we're going to be getting more to the LS engine and putting it together later. But thanks, Jeff, for bringing us this 
incredibly important piece and also being able to share a little bit of advice to everybody that, hey, just because you used to have one of these and you use this to prime it, if you got one of those on your motor, you better have one of those. Thanks for watching. Thanks a lot. What better way to keep things going here at the Engine Performance Expo than to add another super mine, <laughs> Ben Strader. Ben, welcome, Lake. Of hey. course, we are rolling along. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you guys have been going through this project, right? The engine has been amazing. But all seeing all these parts and pieces that are applied to it, vital, absolutely vital. We're going to talk about another one right here. Oh, yeah. So we talked about earlier about the gapless gas ported ring that we had for the package because we had the Mala pistons that didn't have gas ports. So it was perfect to be able to have a gas ported ring to, to fit the application to make sure we were able to get the maximum seal. Well, one of the things that I never knew about until we did this project, I mean, I've used ATI balancers and dampeners for years. Kind of the standard, isn't it? It is. It is the go-to. Absolutely. Um, I never know they had one that had two keyways in it because there's a blower dampener. Yeah, you know, if you don't have those two keyways and you put a lot of extra force from that, you know, you got to do the work to make mm -hmm. the boost. It really has trouble with only a single keyway or like in a stock crankshaft with no keyway. It's a real problem. So, yeah, they make that. You can just order it up and put it right on there and two keyways. And man, it's like a million times better. And it was, you know, we talked about bolt on parts and, and all that. It literally was the only thing to be Finally, bolt on the engine. actually fit that was going on the engine. Didn't need to be modified. Yeah. <laughs> right, you know. I called up JC and ATI. I'm like, hey, man, we need this thing. Because uh, uh, Jimmy said, hey, we got to have a two-keyway deal for this blower. And he's like, okay, well, what, what kind of belt you're running? And I told, Jimmy told me, I said, I, we need this. He's like, okay. Like, literally three days later, it shows up and it bolts right on. I'm and, like. And just the fact that they make that, that's a part that you can order for an engine like this and bolt on, it says something, right? Because you'd be tempted to say, well, a factory LS doesn't use a keyway at all. So I already have all this aftermarket crankshaft. I have one keyway. That's probably enough. And who knows? Maybe with the lower boost level that we were running, it might have been okay. But the fact that they put all this R&D and all this engineering and testing that they saw enough to make a part number with two keyways, that should be a clue. If you're out there thinking about, hey, I want to run all the boost, you really need to be able to make sure you can drive that thing reliably. And yeah. one of the elements that I get, and, and guys, here's the deal. Like, I'm blown away by all of this. And I, I'm a... a I love this stuff, right? But I always think about the numbers. And a little insurance is worth a lot. A little bit of insurance is worth so much. You're going through all this time and effort and hearing you guys talk about it and to think that, yeah, you know, we're gonna skimp out on this element yeah. that could have protected us from some sort of catastrophic failure. Why not just take the extra step? Well, and when you skip this step in terms of, um, you know, the damper and the harmonic balancers that are going on these engines, when you cheap out there and you skip on that step, you're right, it can be catastrophic, right? And at the types of engine speeds we're turning, when something goes wrong, it's not like you think, oh, hey, what's that noise? What's that sound? Maybe we should stop and check it. It's too late. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're six, seven, eight thousand RPMs. You know, the number of times per second that that engine's doing all this work. By the time you hear it, you can't close the throttle on the dyno fast enough. So a small investment up front, Joe, you're right. It's like insurance policy. It goes so far that you just now you can sleep and not worry about it. You can go to go to sleep at night and not wonder if that keyway is giving way or if my supercharger is going to break the snout off the crankshaft or whatever. So that was a no brainer decision for this project. I can't stop hearing Warren Johnson say, if you can't tune it up, if you blew it up. Yeah. So skip that part and you get to have a lot more fun on the dyno. Right. Yeah. And it makes perfect sense. You just think about like the single keyway in there. You think well, all the force that is on that little piece of metal yep. in there. Like that's a lot of force. Like what could happen there? Well, they have taken their time and done their due diligence to double it. Yeah, that's right. And for years, you know, a lot of the modifications where guys would put big block Chevy crank snouts mm -hmm. on their custom small block Chevy crankshafts when they knew they were gonna run a blower. So there's an unbelievable amount of force that's going on out there on the front of that crankshaft. And it's it's hanging out there off the front of the engine. So if you got a drag car, let's say, that mm -hmm. has a lot of traction, think about the amount of force that that thing's generating on the end of the crankshaft, like when you do a wheelie. So now it's not just rotating, but it's also bending that crankshaft out there, hanging off there. So the more effort we can put into handling all that stuff in the beginning, the less problems we're gonna have later on. Exactly, exactly. And the guys at ATI, they are not just uh, into balancers though. No. Uh, and when you get out there on the track and you're talking about consistency 
and going rounds, you need some fluids that are going to stay consistent over the long haul. That's a big part of success and victory, right? Having yep. consistent uh, performance, and they've been involved in transmission fluid for a long time as well. Well, that was a natural outgrowth of them doing torque converters because mm -hmm. it's a fluid coupler. That's all a torque converter is, is a fluid coupler. And for years, they were able to use the fluids that were available at the parts store. But like everything else in oil, things have changed chemically over time. And because at Gibbs, every Joe Gibbs racing engine, and I'm speaking for Mark Cronquist right now, uses an ATI dampener and always has. And so when they started having problems, them being ATI, seeing, hey, we, we see inconsistencies in the performance of our product in the field, and we've been able to track that down to the choice of fluid people are using, we want to eliminate that variable. We want to have the proper fluid so our customers get the results they're expecting. They came to us. Does them no good to build a better mousetrap mechanically if the fluids that you're putting in it don't do the job, right? Right. And so as fluids got slipperier and all those kind of things, well, Turbo 400, you have to have grip. But the old Type F transmission fluids that gave you grip would get roasted when you're <laughs> staging a car that makes 3,000 horsepower. So yeah. they came to us and we worked to develop a synthetic Type F for them, which is the Super F, which means these are products I formulated. It was great working with JC and those guys there to do all the testing, to figure it out, because they have their, their own dynos for the transmissions. So this was, and they, of course they have their own drag cars, they race, Absolutely. so we were able to figure it all out. And then, hey, you know what? I actually even use that Super F Max Duty in our go-karts. Me and my dad use it in the clutches in the carts because it made them more consistent and easier to tune. So, so, so the guys at ATI figured out what you've been preaching for years, which was the four R's, right? So yep. it had to be the right fluid in the right place at the right time and the right amount. Yes, sir. And whether that's in the oil pan or in the torque converter, it's got to be the right stuff. Exactly. And it, makes, it just makes a difference. So we started off with the one fluid, then we changed viscosities to a, a 20 weight, a 30 weight, and they even got a 0W8 for the stock guys where you got to get every last little bit of power out of it and everything. So it's just the evolution of trying to find that last little bit. Hey, back to what are we doing here? We're trying to make things better. How do you get better? It's details. Simple as that. All right, what we're going to do is we're going to increase the collective IQ of the panel. I'm going to leave <laughs> and I will be replaced by Mr. Billy Godbold joining Lake and Ben after this. Well, this will be fun. What a day, what a day, what a day. I yeah, my, brain, my brain is swollen. I've learned so much today. They told us, don't start cars. We are not going to listen. 